Hello everybody. Let's take an issue and ask JP today. The question of today is Maruti Ramakrishna. He is from Vijayawada, he is a student. Maruti, please go ahead. Hi JP sir, my name Hi. is Maruti Ramakrishna and I am from Vijayawada. Today I have uh, two questions for you. The first one uh, regarding the electoral system that we are following. Like, uh, you know that we are following the first post, past the post electoral system. Uh, but I was listening somewhere that if you move to the preferential type of voting system uh, with the proportional representation that uh, people from the constituency directly voting to the political parties instead of the candidates, then there can be a reduction of the political spending of the candidates in the constituency. So uh, uh, my, my doubt, uh, because uh, there is a lack of internal party democracy in India as such, uh, the party president itself uh, is the de facto private owner of the party de uh, determining which candidate should be given the B forms in which constituency. And uh, there is a deep polarization which, which is well established in the society now. So, uh, keeping these two parameters uh, in mind, whether such a move to the proportional representation would do any favor or uh, at least would cleanse our legislature, le legislature? This is my first question. And my second question is, uh, as you know, we are all uh, moving, uh, becoming more environmental friendly. And uh, as a country, we have pledged many uh, pledges in the international for for forums. So, uh, at the individual level, whether my behavior can be uh, turned towards more uh, environmental friendly by having any reservation system uh, uh, based on how eco-friendly I am, like we are having the reservation system for caste. So like that, uh, any reservation system uh, depending on how eco-friendly I am, based on that. So can we think of that uh, policy as such? Thank you. Thank you, Marti, for those questions. The first question about the electoral system. I have always argued that the first past the post system, the winner take all system, whereby only two parties, two candidates are really relevant. If you are a third party or third candidate, even if you are a very worthy person or a worthy political party, you get almost no vote. And that's a pattern in all the countries that embrace the first past the post system. India is not unique. India, Britain, United States, Canada, it's a, it's a normal pattern of the first past the post system. First, before addressing the question, let's understand one thing. No system is perfect. All electoral systems have their flaws. And it's very common for countries or groups in countries with a certain kind of electoral system to lament about the inadequacies and then wistfully ask for another kind of a system. So no system is perfect. You have some strengths, some weaknesses. You have to look at your own country's circumstances. What are the critical political challenges? And therefore, what are the strengths and weaknesses vis-a-vis -vis your problems of a particular electoral system, a particular model? And then have adequate safeguards to ensure that you have all the positives, but very few negatives coming from that system. That is the right way. So it's not this or that, that there's only one answer. The reason why people like me articulate in favor of the proportionality model is that it removes the incentive for many bad things that are happening in India. The political parties have the incentive somehow to get a strong man who will win in the constituency, however bad the fellow is. Take the case of Braj Bhushan Singh, the much talked about person who is heading the wrestling federation, accused of certain serious gender harassment cases. I don't want to go into merits and demerits, I don't know the facts. But the governing party at the national level understands that it is undermining their credibility and reputation. But they are not able to act decisively against the individual. Why? This gentleman, he won in three Lok Sabha constituencies separately the election. I don't know if there are many Indians, even major leaders of the country, who won from three separate constituencies on separate occasions to Lok Sabha. So he has a certain caste and organizational and other sway in a certain region of Uttar Pradesh. 
Now for a party now, to win locally, you require strong men, principles and propriety be damned. But in the process, you undermine your credibility and reputation in a larger geography, in a whole state of the country. And sometimes when the parties try to do the right thing, they pay politically a very heavy price. So political parties have an incentive, sadly, to appoint candidates who are unsavory, who are not the right kind of people, but who somehow win the election, win ability. The candidates have an incentive to spread the money widely, distribute very widely, because the marginal vote required to get elected in a winner-take-all system, you don't know where it's going to come from. So give money to as many people as are possible. Now, habitually in many states in the country, the system has now degenerated to a level where huge amounts of money are transferred to the voters before the election on a fairly large scale, in some cases 50 to 60 percent of the voters. Some cases maybe even more. Telangana, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, they are the leaders in this terrible practice. But many other states are following suit. The incentives are all wrong. Now, unless you alter these incentives, a better class of people, better class of decision-making, better governance, they're unlikely to happen. Now, it's all about individual aspirations and dreams. You've seen in Karnataka how in the last minute, major players from one party switch to another party. You are chief minister of a political party, in a political party, then you join another party quite happily. Because Politics in our current system of the first-past-the-post system is seen as an opportunity for individual aggrandizement. It is about me. If I have money, if I have clout, if I have the right kind of caste, if I have muscle power, then I want to be an MLA, I want to be an MP. It's my birthright. Why? Nobody questions that. It's all about your feudal power, irrelevant, your personal relevance. That's how the system has degenerated, particularly in the absence of local governments. And therefore, the local MLA has become the king of the constituency, the uncrowned king, unconstitutional king of the constituency, transfers, postings, contracts, tenders, police cases, everything decided at the behest of the king, the local MLA. Now, this is dysfunction. This is not the way the constitution is supposed to function. If you move towards a proportionality model, the incentives are dramatically altered. The party's electoral success depends not on the strong men in the locality or large vote in a locality, but overall voting percentage in a whole state. Therefore, your reputation, your credibility, your agenda, they matter much more than the strong men you appoint locally as candidates. Principles be damned. Similarly, for the candidate, a group of candidates get elected by virtue of the party's overall voting rather than an individual getting a political benefit by distributing money. The incentives are altered. For the voter, even if I know today in the present electoral system there is an outstanding candidate but does not have a chance of winning because you must actually win outright. You must get more votes than any other candidate. Then even if I like you, I don't vote for you. Even if I like your party, I don't vote for your party. You have seen Congress and BJP, however mighty they are in many parts of the country. In several parts of the country, they get hardly any vote, even if they have sympathizers and supporters, because people know intuitively a vote for that party is a waste. Andhra Pradesh, Congress and BJP, you take. Tamil Nadu, BJP. Or Kerala, BJP. Or some other party, somewhere else. So the voter now has an incentive in an altered system, because if I really like a political party, even if 5-10% vote goes to them, then that party will get that many seats. I like their philosophy, I like their party or their ideas, their agenda, and therefore I want to keep it alive and I want them to have the bargaining power to be able to influence the decision making on the legislation and the budgets at the state or national level. So incentives for the party, for the candidate, for the people, the voters, are radically different in the PR model. And that's why for Indian conditions with certain safeguards, I believe that's the best and easiest way to reform our system. Because you don't require any constitutional change. Baba Sahib Ambedkar and the Constituent Assembly, they provided for that in the Constitution itself. 
If you carefully read the wording of the constitution about the constituencies and the seats, it provides for proportional representation. You only require a simple change in law. About the potential problems, one is the lack of internal democracy. Maruti is absolutely right. Our parties are autocratic, they run as private fiat terms. If you allow the parties to nominate, party leaders to nominate candidates at will in a list system of the proportional representation, then even the limited check of the candidate's viability locally dictating the party's actions, even that will disappear. Therefore, party leaders become totally autocratic and that's not something that we should want. Therefore, this must be accompanied by some mechanism legally by which the party members vote and decide who their candidates are and in what order they, they are listed as candidates. It can be a whole primary election of all the members. It can even be an elected members of the party in the constituency, like a constituency committee in Britain. They sit and decide who their parliamentary candidate is. You can have legal safeguards. That is necessary in my judgment and I agree with Maruti. But even if that doesn't happen, it should happen. We must fight for that. The system still will yield good dividends because right now a third party is not viable. Supposing a party leadership is acting very arbitrarily, very unfairly, denying opportunity to competent people and good ideas. Now they have no recourse. They have to swallow that in silence or disappear from politics, resign. Whereas in the proportionality model, supposing there are enough people in a party who are discontented because of the party leadership's actions and dictatorship. They have ideas which are actually innovative and fresh, the party is accepting them. If they are confident that about, let's say, 10% of people are willing to embrace them, then they can actually become a viable political formation. So parties will always be on, their, on the guard. Right now, there is no fear. Party leaders are supreme. There is no fear that somebody might leave the party if they are sufficiently disappointed because they have no option. Whereas in this alternative model, a small party can be viable on the, idea, on the basis of ideas and principles and personalities. Therefore, parties cannot be autocratic the way they are. But in any case, it is necessary to have internal democracy within the parties. But what about polarization and division and caste and religious lines? Already, people are voting on the basis of caste. You see it in Karnataka, you see it in many states. Our politics mostly, if not wholly, centers around castes. That's not the kind of democracy we want to build in the long term, right? So if every caste creates a party for itself and votes for its own caste party, then will not Indian polity be fragmented? Do you want it? Absolutely not. We must try and bring interest aggregation, consolidation of social forces rather than fragmentation. And it is true that in a proportional dependent system, there is a greater danger of fragmentation. Already it is happening. So the answer to that is have a reasonable threshold. Supposing you allow every 1%, 2%, 3% party to uh, uh, cast to become a party and then get that vote and representation, then there is more fragmentation. Supposing you say, unless you have, let us say, 10% vote in a whole state, you will not get representation. Then there is an incentive to consolidate rather than to fragment. And 10%, trust me, in a big state is actually a significant vote. Just because you happen to be a caste-based party, you won't get 10% vote easily. Almost nowhere in India can a caste-based party and a single caste base can get 10% vote. So some reasonable threshold. In my judgment, a 10% vote in a major state is a reasonable threshold. So you require that threshold to ward off the danger of fragmentation. So as I said before, no system is perfect. Every system has its strengths and weaknesses. There's another weakness of proportional representation. It will not guarantee stable governments because it's unlikely that a party will get 50% plus votes consistently. It will not. In the present model, even a 40% vote or 43% vote can give you a stable majority. Karnataka got a little over 40%, but they got a two-thirds majority in the assembly. That's the way the present system works. 
Now, are we giving up stability? Do you want unstable governments in the states of the union? Not at all. For that also, there is an answer. Many countries practice it. Supposing the largest party gets bonus seats, let's say 10% bonus seats. It's for the system to collectively decide on the basis of consensus. What percentage of additional seats does the party get if it's the largest party? So that they're more likely to be a majority party. Even if they get minority votes, they still will be a majority party. So you have the benefits of both. Stability of government and altering the incentives in electoral politics so that the dirty practices and the bad kind of recruitment that's happening today is no longer necessary. So no system is perfect. Let me again reiterate. But we have to look at our conditions and we have to look at models suitable our to our requirements and adapt it to our requirements. Don't be puritanical in approach. Look at what is best for us. Think through it very carefully because you can't be whimsical. You cannot be casual, arbitrary about these matters. You have to be very thoughtful, evidence-based. And only after building a consensus should you attempt a systemic change of this kind. Another question Maruti asked about environment. Is there a feasibility of measuring individual conduct which is environmental friendly and giving them preferential treatment in employment or education? It simply is not possible. How are you going to measure each individual's behavior and conduct? Other forms of incentives are both possible and necessary. Companies can be incentivized. Already globally, there's a practice of green credits, for instance. They can be carbon tax, so that your behavior as a consumer changes. You do not spend too much on the, on the polluting fuels or, or fuels which release carbon dioxide or incentives for electric vehicles. Already that is ha happening. Incentives for solar power generation. So you can, by tax measures or by corporate mechanisms, market mechanisms, create incentives to alter behavior and give reward like green credits. But for individuals to be measured on that basis, this simply is not a feasible proposition. This is something that we need to do collectively for our own future and the future of our children. Therefore, while the state and the economic policies and incentives and disincentives must operate, for instance, high taxation of petroleum production and uh, carbon tax, so that people understand the pain of it. It's a necessary thing. Almost all European countries have petrol and diesel selling at higher prices than in India. Not because the price itself is necessarily high, but because they believe that they must create an incentive to move to renewable fuels, more green energies. India too adopts that method broadly, not to the extent as European countries do. That's why when people argue that the petrol prices must come down, I think it's bad policy. Not only is it that we are importing enormous amount of uh, fossil fuels and our foreign exchange is depleted and our current account balance is getting into negative on account of that, but it's also bad in the long term because these are polluting fuels. And therefore, taxing heavily so that there is an incentive to move to alternative fuels is a good idea. So those are the kinds of mechanisms that are required for protecting the environment, not individual affirmative action policies and reservations. I don't see how that's going to be feasible.